Hi, Sharon. Yeah. Hi, this is Key with Community Gossip. How are you? I'm oh, you good. I'm fine. Okay. Um, so just to give everyone a little background, I just want to let them know that you did reach out to me through DM and said that you have some exclusive information that you have regarding R. Kelly and the women from Surviving R. Kelly. So before we get into that, can you just give them a little background of who you are? Uh, I'm Sharon Winbush. I worked for R. Kelly for two years from 97. I worked 97 and 98, those two years, um, which is the critical time when uh, Sparkle says that she introduced her niece to Robert. I worked in his home every single day, uh, four hours a day, sometimes six hours a day, depending on what we had to do. So I interfaced with uh, Robert and his wife, Drea, on a daily basis and know everyone around him and know all of the things that occurred around the case. When uh, Lifetime gave the documentary, they did not give a lie detector test to any of the women to even tell if they were telling the truth. Mm -hmm. And since I know Sparkle and I know Drea, um, and because I worked in his home, I would know inconsistencies and uh, mistruths that were spoken. And so after listening to uh, Drea give interview after interview after interview, where so many inconsistencies were she was just withholding critical information. I just felt I had to speak up. I usually don't speak on my clients because um, I work with a lot of high-profile multimillionaires and billionaires, and they really do not like you talking about them or their business to the right, media. Right, right. And, um, and I've never done it. But um, in this particular case, I felt compelled to because there's no balance and there's so much um, negativity that's coming at him and nobody's presenting um, any of the dirt that they have contributed and they're not um, talking about the positive stuff. You know, so they're just painting him as this one-dimensional character that just simply is not true. So I wanted to speak and give a balanced account of, of what I know. Okay, and like you told me through DM, you did not sign a confidentiality statement with him, so you are free to speak on this. Yeah, I haven't signed a confidentiality statement with Robert. Okay, so if, whenever you're ready, you can just go right into what you disagree with and, you know, what you feel are lies from the docuseries. Well, let's start with what got this ball rolling to begin with. Okay. It was Sparkle saying that her niece was on the sex tape. She said in a Madame Noir uh, interview that you can look at on YouTube that she never had a relationship with Robert. There was one particular day that she came by his house at 11 o'clock in the morning. Now, mind you, he lived in the house with his wife and kids. Mm -hmm. But this particular morning, his wife and kids weren't there. <clears throat> the doorbell rings. Robert goes to get the door. I'm in the kitchen preparing food. And in storms sparkle. Um, I recognize her, obviously, from the videos. She gets to the kitchen first, and she's giving me this jealous look is all I can characterize it as. So Robert comes up behind her, and he says, oh, this is the best nutritionist in the world. He introduces us. I reach over the counter to, you know, extend my hand. I say hi and wanted to shake her hand. She rolled her eyes and stormed off. And then she proceeded to go from room to room to room as if she were looking for evidence that another woman was there or that he was married. Robert got married and didn't tell anyone. He, it was a secret marriage. So only the people in his house knew that he was married and had a child at that time, uh, Joanne. So my assessment of what happened that day is Sparkle found out that he got married and she confronted him and came over and wanted to find evidence. And that's why he had Drea go to her mother's that day. So I can hear them going from room to room to room. And he's acting like, you know, a, a guy that's been caught and he's trying to explain himself. And, and she's acting like, you know, she's on a mission 
to find evidence that um, he has a woman living there. Um, I end up leaving because it was, you know, I was done with whatever I had to do, so I left, but she was still there when I left. Then later on, um, a few months later, I found some naked pictures of her in a drawer of his. She was on a bed with, I think, three or four other girls. They were all in black panties and being intimate with each other. Robert was not in any of the photos, so I assumed he was taking them. Uh, But the pictures were in a drawer. They were stuff underneath some stuff. And the only female that I did recognize was Sparkle. The day that she came by uh, at 11 a.m., she also had on a see-through skirt with black panties. So that seemed to be a thing. And it was, you know, sort of gossip with the inside uh, camp that he and Sparkle had a relationship. So when she said on Madame Noir that she never got involved with Robert, that I believe is is a lie. I've never seen them intimate, but I saw the naked pictures of her. Um, Well, uh, she and the other girls had on black panties, but they were being intimate. And um, I saw how she moved through his house. Now, if Robert is as controlling as everybody is saying, then there's no way he would let an employee move through his house uh, as if they owned it. He would have stopped that. Mm-hmm. But that's something that a boyfriend does when his girlfriend is is confronting him. And so that was the vibe I got. That was the energy I got. Now, I believe, and this is just my assessment from the things that I've heard from people uh, in Robert's inner circle, I believe uh, that happened uh 1998. I believe sometime 2000 or 2001, she found confirmation that Robert was, in fact, married with a child. And then the tape was released. Uh, But the tape went to the Sun-Times, and it went to the music critic at the Sun-Times. And that's a critical piece of information, because whoever did it, the intent was to destroy Robert's career. Robert had told his inner circle that it was a manager, Sparkle, and a couple of other people who had plotted to destroy his career. Um, The manager had gotten fired, I believe, that January. Sparkle had found out about Drea and the baby, which gave her motive to lie. And also uh, the the other couple of people had had been fired as well. So uh, her not saying that she was intimately involved with Robert and exaggerating the age of the girl uh, speaks to having a a hidden agenda, in my opinion. I knew her niece. Her niece came to the house. Actually, Drea is the one that introduced me to the niece because uh, she was over the house regularly, and Drea told me that was her goddaughter. So as I was preparing food in the kitchen, the girl would be in there uh, sitting at the counter talking to me uh, quite a bit. And she would be on the phone with her mother. I talked to her mother. Um, and she, uh, at that time, that was 1997, I met her. She told me she was 13. Fast forward to 2000, uh, she would have been 16. The sex tape that came out was date stamped for uh, early 2000. If that was Sparkle's niece, she would have been 16. But Mark uh, Sparkle kept pushing the narrative that the girl was 14. So those are all major inconsistencies. And if you're in a court of law, those are things that a judge would notice, and they're things that uh, lawyers and cross-examiners would uh, go over and drive home. Right. But because the documentary is on television and they're doing this in the court of public opinion, everybody's just running off hysterical and chaotic and not looking at the facts and not examining the real information. You can look at the Madame Noir uh, interview where Sparkle says she didn't have a relationship with Robert. That's inconsistent to what I know and what people on the inner circle know. 
you can look at the View interview with Drea where she says she never looked at the sex tape. I find it hard to believe that you thought, you know, in the media it was said that the, the girl in the tape was Sparkle's niece. Drea knew the girl. I find it impossible to believe that she would not have looked at that tape to confirm if it was her or not. I looked at the tape um, because I would have, because I worked in his home, I would have been one of the first people to be subpoenaed. And so I looked at the tape over and over and over because I wanted to clearly identify, was this the girl that I had seen with Drea? And there's a less than 10% chance that it could have been her because uh, you just didn't get a very good view of her face and you never got a, a, a clear view of, you know, her whole body or anything. So mm -hmm. you couldn't really tell height. You couldn't really, it was just hard to ID her from, from the tape. Mm -hmm. And so, um, you know, people say, well, she looked 14. You can't tell someone's age. Uh, in a tape and if it was her she would have been 16 but you cannot tell age from a video stephanie mills is somebody who's very petite and if she, at 25 she looked like she was 15. you have petite women who look like teenagers because they're just small in their build and they haven't developed you know uh the way tall women develop so uh, my assessment was uh, if the girl says it's not her, if the parents say it's not her, then that's all we can go with. And I looked at the tape, and I can't positively ID her from the tape. But it's, I think it's very inconsistent that Drea would, um, would say on the view that she'd never looked at the tape and that she didn't follow the case. <clears throat> so my question to myself is, what is she hiding? Or is she just oblivious to this person's situation or what was going on? So those were things um, with, with those two. But then this Lisa Van Allen lady who has been giving interviews, and you can listen to her interview on The Breakfast Club. She said she stole the tape. She said she did a three-way with Robert because she was living in his house. She said she was 17 at the time. She said she took the tape because she didn't want Robert to have a tape with her on it. All of that's on the uh, Breakfast Club interview. Uh, Robert and his wife lived in that house up until about 2000, and then they moved to a bigger house out in the suburbs. Lisa Van Allen was, I believe, 27 at the time of the trial. So that meant in 2000, she was 19. Robert's house wasn't vacant, vacant from his wife until 2000. So if she lived with Robert, it would have been 2000, which meant she was 19, which meant if she engaged in sex with an underage girl or someone she believed was underage, then she was committing a crime. Exactly. And she's complicit mm -hmm. in, in the crime. But the, the strongest piece of, uh, inconsistency with her was she said she was living with him. She stole the tape because she didn't want him having a tape of her. And then DJ Envy said, well, why aren't you on this tape? She said, I'm not on that tape. Why would you take a tape that you're not on if your purpose was to get a tape of you? So that's an inconsistency. Then she said she took the tape to her hotel room. If you're living with Robert, why would you have a hotel room? You see what I'm saying? Yeah. So those are all inconsistencies um, and blatant lies that they're telling. And the Lifetime docuseries did not give a lie detector test to anyone. They just allowed people to come on there, tell their story, and then, uh, you know, they just promoted it heavily. And if you do that, Unfortunately, you have a lot of people that just want to be on TV. You have a lot of people that feel, if I get on TV, I can eventually make money. I can do interviews. I can do write a book. I can do a reality show. And so when you have that type of mob mentality, to me, it's irresponsible 
of Lifetime not to give lie detector tests to all the women and not to ask critical questions. Because if you're going to publicly execute R. Kelly, you should be very careful to present truthful information and not just uh, innuendo and speculative uh, data. And that's where I think um, a lot of the public were confused because they would see videos of Drea, um, like on her live, where she was celebrating R. Kelly, um, right? Know, affectionately calling her her baby daddy. That you know she's he's a musical genius. But then when everyone see you on the documentary, you know you were a victim. So. I think a lot of people are really confused on what to believe. And like you said, when something's presented to the public, it's public, you know, plays out in the public, it's just going to go by public opinion. And the most important thing is why did she lie on the view and say she never looked at the sex tape? And she's never admitted publicly that she knew the girl uh, who was Sparkle's niece. So she's never come forward with that information, and that's critical information. But she says she wants to be an advocate for women and a voice for the voiceless. Well, you couldn't even speak up for yourself. You can't right. speak, you couldn't speak up for Sparkle's niece. And now you're joining a bandwagon to execute your ex-husband. And that's going to damage your children for the rest of their lives. So how can you be an advocate for anyone when you can't even protect your children? I don't care what she says her children told her, that is their father. And no child wants to see their father uh, being publicly massacred like this. Mm -hmm. No child. And she should have sense enough as a woman and as a mother to know the long-term damage this is going to have on Joanne, Jaya, and Robert Jr. And for her to not care about that, um, and to only care about making herself a name and making some money doing this, I think is appalling because she's not in a position to be an advocate for anyone. She hasn't done self-help. She hasn't read books. She hasn't gone to therapy. How are you going to help anyone? Like, what, what, do you, what makes you think you're advocate material? That makes absolutely no sense. So your only motive can be to make money. And you've sat on all this information uh, up until this year. Why are you revealing it now? Um, I lived in the – well, I didn't live in the, I worked in the house with her, and I saw for two years uh, – Drea drove a Range Rover. She had fur coats, uh, diamond earrings, and this is what I saw, a diamond bracelet, a, a diamond wedding ring. When I needed money to go to the grocery store, Robert sometimes would tell me to get it from her. She'd open her wallet and would have uh, thousands of dollars in $100 bills. <clears throat> he hired me to prepare healthy foods in the house every single day for him and his family, paid my salary. He spent $600 a month, no, $600 a week on groceries. Uh, and once she took me, she drove me to the grocery store because she didn't have cash on her, and she paid for the groceries with her credit card. So she's saying that, you know, he was uh, he was financially abused. I, I don't, like, how? You're living in a multi-million dollar mansion. You have a housekeeper. You have someone preparing healthy meals. They had someone to clean the pool. They had someone to uh, walk the dog. You have a gardener, you have someone um, to take the cars and wash them and gas them up. <clears throat> For 13 years she was with him. She could have worked and gotten a Ph.D. She could have gone to the library and gotten books and studied and started a business. Robert himself was abused. He can't read and write, but he didn't go public with who abused him. He went and focused his energy and made himself one of the most prolific singer-songwriters in history. He's in a position to show people how to pull yourself up from abuse, not her. Every day I saw her reading magazines, gossiping on the phone, talking to her dancer friends. So, so when she, she says that, 
I'm sorry. I was going to ask. So when she go, said no, that, that she had to, uh, I think she said stump her foot or knock on the door to get food. And she had, she was locked in rooms. Cause that's what she was saying on docu-series. You've never witnessed any of that. He would have anyone. Well, keep in mind, Robert worked from his home. So he would have meetings in his house, wherever he was, whatever room he was in, uh, he would sleep and he would turn the phones off while he sleep. The minute he woke up, you knew he was up because the phones would start ringing nonstop, back to back to back. Um, and then people were coming. You know, he would always have five, ten people in the living room waiting to meet him. He didn't want anyone walking into a room overhearing his business. Mm -hmm. So he did want you to knock. You came close enough where you could hear sensitive information. I didn't see that as abuse. I saw that as um, I'm trying to have some privacy conducting business in my home. Okay. I would have to knock. I would have to. So that wasn't just her. It was anybody. He didn't want anybody in his house to, you know, you, if you're talking about an album that you're about to drop, mm -hmm. if you're talking about someone you're about to work with, oh, I'm going to do this song for Michael Jackson. You don't want anybody just walking up, hearing that information, and then going and telling everybody that they talked to, and it gets out before uh, you've had a chance to secure the deal. Mm -hmm. That can blow things. So um, his his living room was a wide open space. So, yeah, she would have to knock, and I would too if I was just going to walk up and approach him. And it's just basically to let him know that you're coming into the space and he can stop talking about whatever it is that he was talking about. So that wasn't abusive. That was him conducting business in his own. Okay. Yes, I um, also seen where one of the kids, I believe it was Joanne, that came out and basically she's saying that um, she had a horrific experience living in the house with him. Um, did you ever witness anything that was that could have come across as abusive with his children? Well, she was a baby okay. at the time, so okay. he was loving and dotive, uh, doting. Um, Robert is, uh, he can be harsh at times and he can be abrasive. A lot of times, <sighs> women have to be very careful how they paint the picture to their children mm -hmm. because their children will then take on some adult baggage that they're not ready for. And I do not want to say that Drea was not abused because I don't know what happened when I was not there. Right. I don't want to minimize any pain that she may have gone through because I was not there 24 hours a day. Right. So I can't speak to that. What I can speak to is her being inconsistent her uh, not telling a balanced story. She's not talking about all the good that he did for her. She lived a 1% lifestyle. 80% of the world lives in poverty. So you got to live in a multi-million dollar house with all this help around you. Shame on you if you didn't use your time wisely. Mm -hmm. Shame on you if you didn't go start a business, educate yourself and get a PhD and do what you needed to do so that when you got to that breaking point, you could just leave and not have to rely on him financially. So I think a lot of it was he stopped giving her money for whatever reason. Um, and that happens in a lot of relationships and in a lot of marriages. But you have to look at the overall picture. Um, you moved into a situation where you were living better than uh, the 99% of the people in the world. Mm -hmm. And you should have capitalized on that. And as I did, he gave me an opportunity to work for him. He was one of the first A-list uh, artists that I worked for, and he was at the top of his game. I didn't squander that. I studied Robert. I watched everything he did. I learned from him. And then I went on to work with Kanye West and his mother, Rahm Emanuel, who's the chief of staff for President Obama, Common, Nas, professional football players, professional basketball players. So I used it as a, a jumping off place, as a, a stepping stone to more. So I don't have any issues with Robert. I don't have any 
I'd never led with sex with him. You know what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. I didn't offer myself physically. So he never said anything to me inappropriate. He never did anything inappropriate. We never crossed those lines with each other. We kept it professional. So um, when I left, I don't have anything bad to say about him. You know, I would never drag him in the public. Anything that I had to say to Robert, I said to him one-on-one. And that will remain between he and I, but I'm going to speak my mind. I'm going to say whatever I have to say. And then we're going to leave in love. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. Like, I love you and let's move on, that type of thing. And I think that's how people should be. If you can't handle a situation, and, and let me say this. I work for a lot of CEOs, a lot of uh, multimillionaires and billionaires. Most of them act like Robert. Most of them have that temperament. And it's because they have a high standard of excellence. They are living their dream at the highest level, and they're juggling so many balls. Everything is critical. You know what I'm saying? Like, Mm -hmm. it's such an intense environment. If you're not built for that, don't go into that arena. It's like stepping on the court with Michael Jordan. If you can't handle that level of play or that level of intensity, then it may not be for you. And all you have to do is look at, what has Drea Sparkle or any of these other women accomplished since their knowing of Robert? If you have to still make money using that man's name, that says you didn't do what you were supposed to do when you had that opportunity. And she was with him the longest. So she should have, uh, you know, she should have been able to start a million dollar business. You're with a man who pulled himself up out of adversity, who couldn't read, couldn't write. He himself was sexually abused all of his childhood, grew up in poverty, and yet he went on to become a multimillionaire and be very successful. You can't learn from that. So I I don't have any sympathy for anyone uh, bashing the person that gave him an opportunity. And if he was abusive, if there were situations where you felt your life was in danger, then leave. Absolutely leave. You know what I'm saying? I'm not saying stay and take abuse, and I'm not minimizing abuse. I'm saying at the first sign of smoke, leave. That's all. You don't stay in a burning building. You don't stay in, in gunfire. You leave. And then that way you don't have to go on TV bashing someone and, and dragging their name and destroying them in the public. I just, I don't condone that behavior. No matter what he's done, uh, this is, you don't do this under any circumstance. And I know with the girl Jocelyn um, Savage and the other girls that were mentioned in the docuseries, I know this was well after your time with him. But do you have any opinion on that as far as their parents um, claiming that they haven't seen them for three years? He's holding them hostage. I can say that I don't believe he's holding anybody hostage. Okay. Robert works 99.9% of the time. He doesn't have the time to do the bullshit that they're saying he did. You know what I'm saying? Like, he's working all the time. He doesn't have time to do that. A lot of times he'll say, sit here, because he's done that to me. He's done it to his personal trainer. Sit here and wait for me. And if you sit there and wait, that's on you. Mm-hmm. I would see, uh, I'd come in and his personal trainer would be there and Robert would be asleep. The personal trainer would sit there for four hours. And then Robert would never get up and he would leave. I would give Robert 20 minutes. If you're not where we're supposed to meet, I'm gone. Mm-hmm. You know? So that's on you. Uh, and I don't think it was so much, I think Robert just, you know, he had so much going, that's what he did. So. Uh, th- that's my take on it. That's my assessment. And I hope it adds some balance and some clarity. Okay. Well, I, I definitely you know. appreciate you talking with me. And yet, you know, I, I think it will because we've only heard from their side. Um, no one has come out on his behalf to speak on what they've witnessed with him. So I definitely believe it would do that. And I want to be very clear. I have not talked to Robert in over 15 years. Mm-hmm. I haven't spoken to him. He doesn't know that I'm speaking out, and it's not even about him. It's about just put, creating balance. Right. I understand. Um, I, I do. I don't believe um, 
how he's being portrayed based on what I know of him. And I think it's being exaggerated. And the other point is anyone that got involved with him after that tape came out, in my opinion, had a hidden agenda. Mm -hmm. You saw him on a tape uh, urinating on someone. We don't know who the girl is. We don't know the age of the girl. That can't be confirmed. But you do see him urinating on someone. And, you know, that may be his sexual uh, proclivity. But if you see that and you still – the other thing, Robert doesn't call people. So anybody that got in his life, you have to call him a hundred times before you reach him. He he doesn't answer phones because he's always in the studio working. So you would have to sit and literally call him a hundred times a day to even reach him one time a week. So anybody that's in his life aggressively, aggressively pursued him. He went to Kenwood High, High School not to troll girls. The, the musical director there was a second mother to him, and she would help him write and compose his music. And he would go to McDonald's because he likes to eat McDonald's. Okay. See, this is the That's first time it. I've ever heard this because everyone made it seem like he goes there to look for girls to prey on. No. The, the musical director, uh, Lena McLenn, is a second mother to him. And because he can't read and write, she helps him compose his his music and put it in musical format okay. so that the other artists can play the, the music. Wow. I mean, it's something so basic and so simple that people are making sinister and ugly. Mm-hmm. Wow. So I don't, I can't comment on the girls uh, that I, you know, if they didn't have anything to do with his home, I can't really say, but Lisa Van Allen, because she said she lived in his home, I, I can speak to that because, um, I know that his family was in his home, so she didn't live with him before 2000. Okay. And the thing is, what I want to let people know, when you're listening to interviews, write things down. Mm -hmm. Write down dates, write down what they say, and then listen to another interview. Write down what they say. You can put these inconsistencies together. Together, Listen to that DJ Envy uh, Breakfast Club interview. You'll hear the inconsistencies right in the interview. Listen to the view where Drea says she didn't um, watch the sex tape. Listen to the Madame Noir video where uh, Sparkle says she had nothing to do with him uh, personally. And so, you know, you got to think for yourself. You can't just accept things at face value. And then it is right after the uh, docuseries aired, then I saw where Sparkle dropped her single, uh, Lisa Van Allen is plugging a book. So like you said, they are definitely using their experience to further their careers. To make money. Yeah. Exactly. Which I don't have a problem with if what you're telling is the truth. Exactly. But when they're, when you're lying and trying to destroy somebody, just so you can get on a reality show, that's insanity I at agree. the highest level. Mm-hmm. And watch they all do a reality show. Wow. Well, you definitely shed a lot of light, Miss Sharon. <laughs> I really appreciate okay, you talking well, to us. I'm glad to talk to you. and um, I hope everybody, you know, just balance it out. That's all. Yeah. Have some balance. And, and don't treat anybody the way you yourself would not want to be treated. Right. Nobody deserves to be treated like this. And separate the artist from the music. Drea said that herself. His personal life is his personal life. If you didn't drag me into all the good that you were living, don't drag me into the, the negative stuff. Right. All right. Okay. Any yes. other questions? No, I think you said everything and I, you know, we'll be sure to put this out and let everyone take from this what they will, but I appreciate you reaching out to me and doing this interview with me. Okay. Thank you. Thank you so much. Bye-bye.